Are any of you doing in-depth studies for your MA? Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Both me and Wendy are conducting, well, hoping to conduct research within the prison. And um, I know my, my contingency plan will be to, if, if I can't get access to uh, the offenders through qualitative interviews, then I will be um, ex, uh, conducting an advertisement for response from the particular offender that I'm advertising to. So um, my, my research will be in uh, post-tariff IBP offenders and the process that they're going through to be uh, released. If I can't get, because obviously I'm only at master's qualification, yes. um, if I can't get access to them through interview, um, I will be advertising in, in um, a prison paper for them to contact me through, uh, through, risk, through writing. Right. So um, that's the only way I'm going to be able to get their perspectives mm-hmm. um, as in-depth as I'll, I'll be able to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how, is, how many people like, do you hope to interview? Um, if, if I do conduct the interviews, um, they'll be semi-structured and they'll be qualitative, obviously, but in, I'd be hoping to get quite a large sample of, of short interviews, hopefully. But um, the, there is quite a large population of RGP offenders still that are post tariff. Right. So for me to conduct research on them, um, I'd have to be able to get access to a lot of different areas. It's probably not as realistic as I was hoping, which is why I've um, thought of other ideas of how to access the, these offenders. Mm. What, what's the overall purpose of your research, Um I think since... <laughs> Again, I've, I've got um, my own opinions of my research before I've even conducted it. I think um, since the abolishment of IPP last year, um, and even even before it was abolished, um, IPP offenders were having difficulty accessing courses. And because their, their sentence plan was so specific, even for short sentences, um, their course access was very limited and very... Um, Difficult. They were having some of them were having to transfer prisons like over and over again just to complete the courses that were sent out put on their sentence plan. So for them to to act now that the abolishment's taken place and obviously the funding isn't there either. So my my interest in is their personal perspectives on how they'd like to be able to get access to proving that they are eligible for parole now, that they should be released. Right. Okay. So. Are there any other studies that you know of that have been carried out on that? Not post-abolishment, no. Um, I'm hoping that something will come out in the new year, uh, January time, but if not, then this this will be the most current piece that will be going forward. Okay. So I imagine that's quite hard for you if there's not a great deal of literature on this. Um, Every every bit of literature that I've got so far is uh, pre-abolishment. Right, right. And how do you think that changes what you're going I to do. I think uh, <laughs> my work will be easily uh, easily picked apart <laughs> <laughs> if, um, if it is published because it's, it will be the first one as to my knowledge it's the first one that will be, that, that will be completed by the time um, by the time that anybody else has done one. What, what would you like to see come out of the research? I think um, I think at the moment a lot of offenders feel quite lost with where they are. They don't. They haven't got anything now to. They've been for parole. They've been knocked back, and they haven't got much understanding of where they're going to go next and how they've got to, pr- how they're able to prove, um, their, that that they're ready for release. If they've completed all their courses, then how much more have they got to do to prove to be released? Um, and I just, I'm hoping that eventually there's going to be some sort of. Um, some sort of impact on on helping them through that process so that they know where they're going to go. Um, they te- the, the parole board do start taking into consideration the efforts that they have to go to to prove themselves. Yeah. They don't get sent to a parole board and released like most offenders. Yeah. They're having to prove repeatedly th- throughout their sentence, really, from the minute they arrive in custody to the minute that they go to the parole board, that they're, they are ready to, to be released. So if I could put it into sort of research words, are, are you 
trying to understand what it's like to be in their situation? Are you trying to get knowledge out there about what it's like to I'm be hoping in their that, um, by gaining them, by gaining knowledge mm-hmm. of them, that something will be implemented to help them through this instead of right. instead of them being so sort of lost in the system while they're waiting for. So I, I'm assuming then you have an idea of, of policies that you would like to see in place, maybe. Um, I, I think, um, obviously, RQP was brought in because they felt that determinate sentences weren't adequate. Um, the, the tariff that was set was half of what the determinate sentence would have been anyway. Um, those that are still serving RQPs, if they are, are not... If they have not been proven of um, adequate thing, of, if you've been trying to rehabilitate, then maybe they should be given an extended sentence instead of continuing an RPP. Mm-hmm. Whereas the people that are continuing their courses and completing their courses and then sitting around waiting to be told where they're going to go next, I think um, maybe a programme should be put into place for them to, to maybe be pushed for release or at least um, begin reintegration sooner. So, you, so you have you have some very clear ideas there, don't you, about about what you would like mm. to come from your research? I think it's yeah, really good. good. I'm an ex-offender, so I think what you're doing is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> it's really interesting. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. Help with the rehabilitation. It yeah. needs it. <laughs> Definitely. Great. Any anything else that, that you'd like to talk about in terms of your own research? Um, I'm a little bit in the same boat as Hayley in terms of there's not much. I'm going to be doing um, the abuse that happens in care homes and also I'm going to look at, I think, the typology of a whistleblower in terms of if there is a typology of a whistleblower. Um, oh, right, OK. If that makes sense. OK. Um, but there's not really that much research, but um, luckily uh, Donald McIntyre has done stuff and is doing more um, with a psychologist, I think. Um, so I don't really know how I'm going to carry my research out as yet, but that is what I'm going to do. Okay, so uh, what could you articulate what your overall purpose is? Um, to, to really try and m- come up with something that can be implemented to put um, strategies in place that could prevent further abuse in these care homes. And I don't know how, I don't know yet, obviously, but that's what, you know, Mm. I want something good to come of it, hopefully. Okay. Countering abuse through whistleblowing, where you consider the position um, that exists between the state of uh, abuse stopped, um, uh, never uh, begun, um, um, punished. Um, and the whistleblower, uh, and there is the, 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 so. What, what, what do we know about whistleblowing? What is whistleblowing? Are there types of whistleblowers? Um, uh, why, why is whistleblowing? Uh, uh, you know, uh, can can we say whistleblowing is good or not? Um, what 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 formal recognition is there to the whistleblower? There's actually quite a lot, isn't there? Encourage the whistleblower, <laughs> um, and it's not just within the context of residential care for old people. Oh, absolutely! It's, 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 it's whistleblowing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's time for a cultural revolution, everyone. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the the apparatchiks had better watch out. And um, you, uh, if you're on the front line and something's up, shout out. So uh, Midstaff's Hospital presents. It's uh, it's, it's very topical. I mean, there are things that have come out already since the exposures program and things like that. There's a a phone line now, um, I think it's called Silver Lining for the elderly. Yes, the um, and there's, you know, there are things happening, so there's probably more out there than I am aware of as yet, but I'll just, I'll have to just do it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite hard though at the early stages, Absolutely. isn't it, to work out exactly what it is you want to do, and again, that may be where having um, a research been helpful log. There, Andrew, that. Is, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that's, you've been helpful just oh, right. all that. <laughs> <laughs> but but having having a log really about where your ideas began and where they've ended up and why you may have changed your position a little bit um, is really important. And I think that's actually 
as important as some of the data that, well, that you'll get. I think that, that's why I'm in, mm. I'm in this sort of, I was given, I was sort of thrown a bone uh, mm. from, from David as to the, this project would be a good idea. Yes. And going into a, a prison and, um, and, and all the ethical, as we were talking about, and the ethical guidelines, and especially mm. with vulnerable um, adults, um, or for anybody who's vulnerable, well, is so in, it, great. And the hurdles you have to go through in terms of um, your, re your ethical um, research through norms, etc. So sometimes you've got to actually stand back and say, well, actually, is there really a project in here? Is there really something that, A, is going to bring something to the field? All the things yes. I alluded to at the beginning. And yes. all, you know, is, there, is there really going to be something? And sometimes that's the hardest thing in research is actually when somebody throws you a bone, you, the automatic reaction is, oh, I'm going to run, I'm going to run. And then sometimes yes. you do have to sometimes stop and mm. think, actually, how is this really going to work out? Is, it, is there going to be a good research question in here? Yes. And ultimately, you know, what's the purpose of this? And you know, am I going to add knowledge? Am I going to? And, and, and that's that's the point I've reached is actually, mm. which is now the only substitute has been to do what I'm going not substitute the only credible way forward is to do what I'm doing later today, which is actually be the the, the woman on the ground, as it were, go in there, yes. experience um, the, the the very thing I'm trying to evaluate, yes. and um, and and actually get a bit of an idea as to how many people might be able to take part in my study and because uh, mm. you cannot write proposals particularly for university and um, eth ethical guidelines um, submitting forms and also into the prison service etc unless they feel that you've got a really credible bit of research there yes. and so that the very first point actually is to try it's and you know to try and actually work out what the proposal and whether it's worth research is always worth it but whether it's actually going to be worth it and sometimes the hardest thing is to sometimes walk away and say actually this isn't going to this isn't going to work on so many levels. And at least, at least with, I suppose, you can argue, answer those questions as to why your research isn't going to work. Yes. And that why it's not worth trying to go through all the extra hurdles to actually get the approval to do it. Because mm. arguably you won't get approval, and especially if you're working in a, in a university setting and you've got time constraints. Yes, that's the big issue, year. isn't you, it? You, you, yes. you can't, you, it doesn't, uh, an academic dissertations or fees or whatever you don't have uh, you have a finite length of time to, to yes. bring it in and therefore sometimes you have to ask yourself very hard questions as to I might want to do this I might but it it's just not going to work and it's and it and the time scales and the it's just or, or actually it's of no value yeah <laughs> I could yes. spend my time yes. doing something which yes. is a great and write 15,000 words someone's <laughs> going to look at it and open it and say Excuse me, <laughs> what's the point? <laughs> yes, I, it, it's like there was a piece of research on uh, something like the how long cornflakes stay crunchy or something that I remember yeah. was um, publicised, I don't know how long ago it was now, it's fairly recently, but, but you kind of think, Time's oh, right. precious, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. too I suppose it must be really important for people in marketing. But, but yeah... Um, you do have to be prepared as a researcher to be knocked back a bit sometimes. Uh, the tendency, I think, for most people is to start out thinking this big <laughs> and you think you can do so much and actually a lot of the best piece of, of research are, are this big. That, you know, think small actually is quite important, especially for students who have got limited finance, limited time. Um, if the smaller you can think, the more likely it is that you're going to produce something that is of value. Operationally, but w worth imagining what possibilities there could be and always situating your bounded activity within context that uh, explains uh, its situation and explains uh, by extension how your work could uh, blossom. Well, yes, and I, and I think often the way research works, we tend to think of it in isolation, but actually what happens is by the process of review that we're all involved in, because you know the first thing you do when you do a piece of research is review the literature, but by that process of reviewing, A, we become more knowledgeable, and we work out what our own perspective is and realise that we can't do everything in a piece of research, so that teaches us how to narrow our research down. And, um, and I, I think that process also teaches us that actually, particularly in the smaller scale pieces of research, 
what we do is see that different pieces of research that are similar but not identical but carried out in different settings start to build up a picture that might give us confidence in a particular the theory that is being developed okay I think that's what happens we start looking wider and we see that this bit here and this bit here is telling us the same sort of thing and, and eventually we get more confidence in what we're thinking um, so it, maybe it just teaches us to see our limitations but also to acknowledge that we can make fairly small steps that in the future might become a bigger step that might help someone to change a policy in the way that you're talking about. Liam, have you told us about your research? Um, well, I've actually just submitted um, an article to the Howard Journal. Oh, um, I worked as a research assistant um, alongside David Wilson, Donna McIntyre and Elizabeth Yardley. Mm -hmm. um, and the paper was about contract killing in the UK. Um, so hiring a hitman to God. kill somebody. Um, there's actually only been five um, research studies on it worldwide. Um, so what we did was, uh, using Nexus, we kind of searched for any cases, reported cases of convicted um, hitmen in the UK. Um, got together all their demographic information of the hitman, the victim and the hit, put them into a database and then analysed this database for any kind of trends that emerged. Um, and we kind of took a critical approach to a guy called Schlesinger. Um, he, he came up with a typology of, of hitmen in Australia. Um, but he, he based his whole typology um, that there was an amateur, semi-professional and a professional hitman on just one case, one case of a, of a professional hitman yeah. who yeah. took out over 100 people. Um, but So from the cases that we looked at, we just found that we could not apply the cases to that typology. It just wouldn't work. Um, so we kind of we developed a new typology really um, for exclusively for British hitmen. Um, so we came up with a um, the cases were the typology sorry was a novice, a dilettante, a veteran, and a master. And so we came up with four different types. Um, and how, how many people did you look? We at? came up with thirty six cases, which we think is a little bit of an underestimate. Um, but look, to be kind of the data was kind of saturated by the end of it, so we just found we just found what we could find. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from that we were able to identify characteristics um, and draw up a typology from that. So mm. Mm. Still quite small to say oh, yeah, this it is. is the typology, oh, yeah, definitely. but yeah. nevertheless mm -hmm. actually finding some information yeah. that is different and, yeah. and it might, I suppose, in the future even yeah. challenge the idea that there is a typology, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it, could even, it could even do that, yeah. couldn't it? There's some um, interesting findings, though. Very like interesting. The youngest, the youngest one we found was 15 when he carried out his hit, so for £200. Any females? One. One female. came across. How yeah, yeah. She? One, she was yeah. 28, I think she was, yeah. And she was Maori. Is it Maori? Maori. Maori. Maori, Maori yeah. that's yeah, it, yeah, 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 Maori, yeah. So just the one female we came across. But, uh, and what, me, yeah. did, did, you, did you do in-depth interviews? No, we didn't do interviews. I no. think, well, actually, um, I think Donald may have had an interview, mm. um, but obviously I couldn't be involved in that. Just right, so the, how, the did, how did you carry out the research itself? It was then, using right? Nexus yeah. database search. Oh, I see, just so to that's, find the, that, that was all you, you that was Because okay. it's just an explorative study to start off with. I see. So just to yeah. kind of bring the data together and analyse it and see if we can identify any trends and patterns. So I think, but like you said, like you know, you say you start off small and it can build mm -hmm. to other things. I think there's three or four other papers in the pipeline on the back yes. of it. So absolutely mm -hmm. impressive. Because if you could mm -hmm. talk to those people, yeah, um, I think that's the, in, I think that's the plan. In depth, you get something about their life histories, wouldn't you? That yeah. might actually explain mm -hmm. um, how they came in to, mm -hmm. especially the female. That, that would be a very interesting perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was really, really interesting. The, the range of reasons and. Yeah, he's using, the 15 year old shot me more than anything, you know, to be in a position where you think, you know, for 200 pound to actually kill somebody. It doesn't shock me as much yeah. just because of the wars that go on in other countries, the soldiers that they recruit, oh, yeah. eight, soldiers, eight, nine, yeah. and Syria. they go out with guns. Yeah, of course, yeah. When, so actually you can indoctrinate, indoctrinate yeah. can't get the words out, um, a much earlier age mm. in a certain yeah. environment. I think just in, in British society, like for a 15 year old to, to shoot dead a mother of one or two yeah. on a doorstep, you know, that's I think shocking it's, it's to be shocking. in this country. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So. I can't remember who this study is by now, but mm. that there is a, a study on gun crime in mm. this country. Mm. 
I'm sorry, my mind's just gone blank. No, no. Um, but the, there is a study that I, I do remember looking at, and they're looking at the different levels, of, so the people who are supplying the guns, mm. and then those who are actually involved in using the yeah. firearms mm -hmm. generally are quite young and powerless. Yeah. Um, it's quite, quite trying interesting. To, trying to impress all really. the people, I think it is. You know. Well, I don't think it's even that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might be to do with their lives mm -hmm. and feeling quite yeah. hopeless about the future. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, those those who are actually setting these crimes up, mm -hmm. um, being able to distance themselves yeah. from, oh, yeah. it's all about from the yeah. young people whose, whose lives seem to count for not very much, which mm -hmm. is really quite sad. Yeah. I'll have to let you know what the study yeah, is and yeah. I can find it. I'll, prob can I'll probably be ready at some point. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I've retired. <laughs>